We're going to be talking about balancing budgets today as part of our ongoing coverage, Decision Alberta, leading up uh, to April 16th, of course, the big day. Everybody has circled on their calendar. As far as you're concerned, based on your political experience, Danielle, where does conversation around balancing budgets need to begin? Do you know, can I can I ask you a reset question first, just so that we have a baseline before we get into this sure. discussion? Because I just had an interview with um, Polster from Main Street Polling. I know they had some trouble predicting the, the mayoral race last time around. He told us what he's done to fix that. But he tweeted out, and Stephen Garter did too, that the NDP is gaining ground in Calgary. He actually said that the NDP is now slightly ahead of the UCP in Calgary. So I'm wondering if we want to adjust at all our early... Maybe each week we should see whether or not we're firm in our predictions for seat count or if we should adjust them slightly. And I just wanted to give you that information to see if you're sticking with 70 seats. Well, I've said 73, by the way. 73? But, Holy cow. But, okay. uh, yeah, no, I, uh, I don't know. I mean, here's the thing. I think it's stupid for me to throw a number out there in the first place uh, because so much can change and elections can be so unpredictable so I'm gonna stay with my number just because it was an interesting one it's what struck me at the time it's like trying to predict how many goals you know Leon Dreisaitl or Johnny Goudreau will have over the course of a year you never know what might happen uh, I, I don't know okay I, I'm, I'm gonna stick with it I'm gonna I'm gonna change mine I'm gonna say still UCP but only 50 and then 35 50 for the NDP wow and then well because here and then I think the Alberta party will win one and I think I think David Kahn has a good chance of winning his seat I, I'd kind of like to see him in the legislature too he's coming forward with some bold ideas and I think his voice would be welcome there but I think because it it looks to me like Edmonton must be firming up for the NDP based on my last conversation and there's still some pockets of support that they have in the province and the rural areas the, the sort of the, the mid-sized cities like down in Lethbridge and if they're competitive and can win um, even a third of the seats in Calgary we're, we're now talking about um, being over 30 seats for the NDP which Alberta party candidate do you have winning their riding well he thinks uh, Greg Clark might win which the former leader in calgary elbow so up against doug schweitzer and remember doug schweitzer is now b bailed out of a couple of of um moderated sessions so he's he's not going to any of the town halls and so that can hurt somebody in a local candidacy but i also like rick fraser there's been some turmoil mm -hmm. in the calgary southeast riding so uh it's he and he has the name recognition having been there for for two terms now it's possible that he could win too so yeah i've seen i've seen some and strong candidates up here in edmonton too i mean it's interesting you have Stephen mandel losing his riding um Catherine O'Neill's an interesting entrant in the race. Uh, she's been uh, working hard and pretty prominently here in Edmonton, uh, and not just because he listens to the show all the time, but Neil Koratash, an interesting... I don't know. Here's the thing, Danielle. The, the, the question needs to be, are people voting based on party or are they voting based on candidate? I think they're probably voting based on leader, and this is just... It. People like Rachel Notley, and they're still trying to figure out Jason Kenney. Even people who are conservative say, yeah, I'm voting UCP, but um, you know, I'm still... It's not that they love Jason Kenney. It's that they think that he... Um, will be the best leader and it's the best party right now and, and that can always be uh, coming down the, to the undecided how you feel about the leader could swing votes either way so all right i'm just amazed that you're still bullish uh so bullish on the ucp well i i mean i guess what i'm saying is like i've already picked my stanley cup final as well it's going to be a reboot of 2004 with the same result the calgary flames are going to lose to the tampa bay lightning maybe in seven games but you know maybe i should adjust that too and amend that i'm just i'm going to stick with it because really it's a prediction i wouldn't i wouldn't put a dollar on it so I'll, I'll caution folks, don't bet against my line. You know what it is? It seemed, to me, I think elections really matter because things can change from the beginning of an election to the end of an election. And so if, you, you always wonder whether or not any of these policy announcements or platform announcements make a difference. I tend, I'm a t I tend to be policy wonky, so I tend to think that they do. And that's probably a, trans a transition back to what we actually are supposed to talk about today, which is, which is the budget. Oh, well, okay. So, over, and, and really, I mean, in election talk, budget, Danielle, we could be talking about budget, but that could lead us into talking about funding for any social service. It could lead us to talking about tax cuts, tax breaks, tax incentives, et cetera. So really, budget talk can be talk about anything that a government does or does not spend on. And we got a clear idea over the weekend of what at least two of the parties, the NDP and the United Conservatives, would do if they form government here in Alberta. What jumped out at you is most notable from, let's start with the United Conservatives. Well, what jumps out at me is the big line number. And I and this is what I'm a little bit confused about, is that you've got the UCP essentially saying that their total expenses are going to be flat. It's going to be $57.5 billion when they start, $57.5 billion by the time they go back into 
re-election. And in the middle, they're going to allow revenues to grow, which will get them to a balanced budget. But then you so then you look at the at the uh, NDP platform, and they've got a line in there uh, for the oil by rail. And so oil by rail is supposed to, I gather, give them extra revenues, but also give them extra expenses. And they're talking about operating expenses that look to me almost lower than what the UCP are talking about, 55.8 billion. So you see what I mean? Like I'm a little bit confused about where the, what the real number is because those are big differences. Are we are we going to have um, a t 10 billion more in revenue relative to what the NDP have to say, or 10 billion less? I, I just don't know that you can have um, m make any de decisions when you have that level of variance. It strikes me that th those are, are pretty pie in the sky numbers. Yeah, and I mean to note the oil by rail plan. That's one of the first cuts. That's one of the first changes that would be implemented under a United Conservative government. That that entire initiative, that entire program. They don't like it. Uh, worth about three and a half billion dollars spending wise uh, the gov or rather I should say the NDP obviously the government at the time when they rolled out that plan obviously pretty optimistic believing that it would more than pay for itself but uh, you know I share the opinion I think of others that that if that's viable this is the same way I feel about refineries to a certain degree uh, and I, maybe we don't open this can right now but if it is especially viable and if there is big boom potential there I think private industry would be in line and lining up to pay for it to fund yeah. it well and our listeners have pointed out three and a half billion dollars you could have bought a pipeline for that and so this is only a temporary program and it's only going to move a hundred thousand barrels per day or or thereabouts and then once it's over we don't even own the rail cars because we're just leasing them so when you look at the cost benefit on that does that actually was that actually good investment yeah, although i mean ask justin trudeau if buying a pipeline automatically means you get to <laughs> triple your expansion it doesn't we know that we're all shareholders in that plan i don't know maybe i would have been i'd be a little more comfortable maybe that's what she should have done maybe she should have bought the trans mountain pipeline off of off of trudeau and then i might have felt a little bit more comfortable with it being in our hands that was actually going to get built but. well it's it, this is an interesting conversation that's had i mean right now it's just murmurs because nobody knows what the i mean what would the sale price of tmx be uh it's obviously different if it's tripled in capacity than if it's not so the federal government you have to assume would would see this one through you don't buy relatively high and sell low it makes no sense but if and when that does come up for purchase it's been suggested that there are many indigenous communities including we've spoken to the Métis Nation of Alberta they'd certainly have a great degree of interest in being a, an equity player there and I wonder if the government of Alberta might be as well I just don't know where the public appetite is on owning pipelines yeah and she did I noticed that in in the NDP platform they did talk about a First Nation ownership stake and facilitating it in some way I don't know what the details around that would be that's why I found the difference between the two is it's really difficult it's funny it's kind of difficult when your government to put forward a bold campaign strategy because anything that you put in there that's bold you can say well you've just had four years to do it why why didn't you do it before and there are a couple of really good ideas in there like these uh, uh, the these two pilot projects for mental health drop-in facilities one in Calgary and one in Edmonton we've been talking about mental health for a long time how difficult it is to access it and what a great idea but why didn't that get implemented implemented before when they had the opportunity to over the last four years. So th that's that's one thing. I also find that it's there aren't very many bold ideas in the NDP platform. Uh, the, the the daycare uh, platform is probably the, the boldest is she's calling it uh, the, the new Medicare of um, uh, of sort of the next generation and which leaves me a little bit nervous because our current Medicare program cost is $20 billion. So I don't know what the upper limit is on how much a universal daycare program if that's the, the ultimate goal how much that's going to end up costing us. What did you make of the Alberta Party's sort of counter-proposal, the idea of funding subsidized daycare but doing it on a tiered level that would see the lowest income earners paying zero, not $25 a day, but it caps it, at, if I remember off the top of my head, at about 110000 a year. Um, listeners, or, you know, I mean, people tuned in, Albertans would be paying $30 a day, and then once you're past that level of income, it's, you know, all bets are off type thing. I, f I far rather targeted support. I mean, it seems to me the more progressive you are the more you like the universal programs and there's some ideology behind that one of the it is that you don't want to stigmatize every anyone so you want everybody to have equal access so that nobody feels like they're getting a subsidy but from a conservative point of view you're, you're just inflating the cost by orders of magnitude over, over what it would be if you just did a targeted program I, I don't think that you would have any disagreement from people about the need to, to target support to those who are looking to better their lives get back into the workplace maybe may have 
have struggles with uh, child care otherwise. I think that you can get 100% agreement on that. Where you end up with the disagreement is whether or not it should apply to everybody. Yeah, and I don't believe that anybody has expressed grave concerns over being stigmatized by GST rebates or carbon tax rebates based on their income levels. <laughs> I, I, I haven't seen that. I don't buy that as a legitimate storyline in Alberta. Well, I think there's the other part of it, too, is that if you have a universal program, you get everybody buying into it so that if you ever propose a change to it, you've got a, a constituency of people saying, no, 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 don't touch it. And so that's part of the other reason why I think uh, progressives like to lock in on universality is so that it makes sure that that, they're, that those programs continue to, to uh, attract the high level of funding and public support. If you're listening in on 770 CHQR, you know where to text us, 403-974-8255, the number the same as it always is here at 630 Chet in Edmonton, 630-630. When we come back, Danielle Smith, Ryan Jesperson, taking a look at budget implications of your decision on April 16th, Decision Alberta. We'll open up the phones as well here in Edmonton, 780-496-0063, 403-974-8255 in Calgary. This is Danielle Smith in Calgary, and of course we've got Ryan Jesperson up in Edmonton at 630 Ched. Uh, I have a couple of people asking me whether or not that interview that I did with Main Street was an April Fool's Day joke. I don't think so, <laughs> but I'm going to continue watching because you can play jokes up until noon today, but I don't think so. I You're think talking about the NDP polling higher yeah, in Calgary? Yeah, and uh, maybe maybe I've been punked. May maybe it actually was a, an April Fool's Day joke. I'll, I'll have to keep an eye open for that one. It's my well, birthday today, Ryan, so I, oh, I, ask is it really? I ask people not to play any jokes on me on my birthday, but there's still another hour and 40 minutes to go until they have to stop playing jokes and come clean on it, so that may well have been an April Fool's Day joke, but I... I I don't know. I seem to think that in in Calgary, it's an unpredictable because we have a progressive council with a strong progressive mayor, and that can be a factor in elections. And so I don't think it's as walk away uh, for the UCP as uh, a lot of uh, my listeners would probably hope. It well, would I mean, be. a lot of people thought that Bill Smith was going to be the mayor in a walk away, right? And, and that's not the case. For, for me, polling, I take all polling with a grain of salt, which is why I, I, I really think that the only thing that, that we'll actually know definitively is the results of the election after the election. Uh, so I'll, I'll be curious to see how that happens. I, I I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, rural Alberta, we see trends. Uh, Danielle, I know we took our show on the road to Drayton Valley last week. Yeah, uh, just a, Oh, it was wonderful. The people of Drayton Valley opened up their arms to us. They packed. We had a live studio audience packed to the rafters. I mean, it was just great. Hearing firsthand, instead of opening up the phones, we had Drayton Valley and Devon residents stepping up to the podium microphone and talking to us eye to eye, which is very powerful. Uh, but you got, the, you got the sense, and this is a limited sound size and the room could have been stacked with conservatives but the the response that the conservative candidate received there speaking live in front of the studio audience versus you know the Alberta liberal candidate the Alberta advantage candidate the NDP candidate the Alberta party candidate uh, it, it was demonstrably dramatically different uh, standing ovation versus crickets well I'm sure uh, and this will be in most rural areas you're going to get overwhelming super majorities for the UCP I would say it's the it's the it's once you get uh, into an urban environment it, it changes and I don't know if it's the the change in emphasis because some people are asking me the question is it because the promises that the NDP are making like $25 a day daycare as if we're not in debt enough and pay taxes through the roof and need oil and gas it's unbelievable to me that people would consider voting NDP that comes from one of my listeners but I think that that's what it is is it depends on whether or not you think that you need government as a force for good in your life and the more spending they do the happier your life will be or if you think hey I can handle myself just get out of my life, leave me with lower taxes, allow me to create jobs or get a job, and the economy will, will pretty well take care of itself without government intervention. I think that that's the, the, the debate that's playing out in this election, and that's part of the reason why it uh, it could go either way. And, and there's a lot of a number crunching that people need to do. Uh, you know, this is, uh, I mean, let me, let me read this. John listening in from Stony Plain this morning on the text line says, taxpayers may not mind paying their fair share as long as they see where it goes. They understand where the money comes from as well. He says, most of us don't understand either, and this allows politicians to concoct fantastic stories to get elected. He says, while a portion of our population may be illiterate, there are also people that are innumerate, <laughs> says John. Let's just say financially illiterate, which is what he's getting at. He says, people need to see real numbers like the sticker on the gas pumps, breaking down how much of that cost is due to taxes.
is. And so we see, for example, the NDP crunching their numbers and saying, you know, with a $500 million investment next year and a $1.5 billion investment over the next five years in a so-called universal child care scenario, and let's just call it subsidized child care, they believe that the return on investment there happens and that it happens by putting more people into the workforce, allowing people to return and pursue their entrepreneurial dreams, etc. That's one example. Another interesting example from, uh, and you, you know, you're you're uh, providing some optimism for David Kahn's campaign, the leader of the Alberta Liberals. Pretty interesting to see him tee up that conversation that nobody seems to have the stones to tee up, Danielle, and that is of a provincial sales tax. He says it would come with a, a nice reduction of personal income tax, and they believe that Alberta would be a billion dollars in the black, comparatively speaking to our current structure. So yep. while some may say, ah, it's just more taxes, the Alberta Liberals saying, yeah, but it might work out better for the province. Well, that's why I think it'd be really interesting to see David Kahn there. I think he, he will he will say some things that no other party can say for fear of losing elections. Um, and it's sometimes nice to have that voice in the discussion to get people thinking. Because uh, when he put it out there that uh, a couple would be able to earn up to about $115,000 before paying any provincial income tax, and then the, in exchange, you have to be prepared to pay 15% for a combined GST, PST called an HST. I just thought, I'd probably be better off under that scenario. The problem is that would it actually be implemented that way? Or would it be implemented, ah, we've got your agreement on a sales tax, and you may start off with the high basic personal exemption, and then slowly over time, it's, well, we need to bring that back a bit. And so then it's a 40,000 basic personal exemption, and then the 30,000 basic personal exemption, and pretty soon you're at a point where overall your tax bill is a lot higher and people feel tricked. I think that that's why why people are, are thinking, okay, nice in theory, but would it work that way in practice? Sure. Appreciate Michelle Brandenburg. Uh, looks like Michelle's watching us live on Facebook Live. Uh, of course, if you like the 770 CHQR 630 Ched pages on Facebook, you'll be seeing us streaming right now. Uh, Michelle says any job loss or cuts to health, education, any social programming will increase the need for those such things. A lot of people believe you start cutting back on health care, education, all of a sudden maybe down the line you got to pay more on health care or maybe even, I mean, expenditures with the justice system, for example. Well, I guess the other way of looking at it is that if you don't restrain spending now then and you continue to have deficit then at what what kind of decisions are you going to have to make 10 years from now if you don't get your house in order? I mean, I'm of the view that if you don't see a government get into balanced budget in the, the term they have in office, then they're not going to. And if you look at, at Notley's approach versus Kenny, Kenny has said, yes, by the time I go into the next election, we'll have surpluses. Notley says, no, it'll be one more year. So you're going to have to count on them going through an entire another four-year election cycle before they're they're willing to balance the budget. And then and then what's going to change then? What are going to be the other excuses about why they can't balance the budget? I, I just don't think they have the commitment to it, quite frankly. And that's what I think p people are going to judge them on. Should we top up our coffees? Let's top up our coffees, yeah. We have, a, 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 I've, I've got a bunch of people on the line here, Mel and Brian and Jim on the line. I'm assuming that you've got a, a couple on, on your end as well. Uh, before we, we leave that though, have you seen anything interesting out of the Alberta party or the um, or the Greens on, on the budget matters? I was surprised to see that, that Mayor Mandel had talked about eliminating the carbon tax. I didn't think that that's where the Alberta party was. Yeah, nor did I. I was surprised by that, and, and we can get into that in the second half of this. Uh, I, I, I'll be honest, I haven't seen anything from the Greens. Maybe it gives me three minutes now to go look for it. Okay, I'll let you go to do that. Uh, it's Danielle Smith here with Ryan Jesperson. We'll continue the discussion after this on Chorus Radio. You're listening to a province-wide discussion this morning. Ryan Jesperson, Danielle Smith with you on Chorus Radio stations across Alberta, 770 CHQR, 630 Chet, as we take a look at Decision Alberta balancing budgets. Danielle? Uh, Ryan, I just wanted to give some analysis from Trevor Toome as well because um, he he is always the spoiler. He'll let you know whether or not you're on the right track, but he'll certainly let you know when you're on the wrong track. One of the things he says about the NDP budget plan is that it relies too heavily on royalty revenues. He says the government is estimating royalties to be $12.3 billion by 2023. Now, when you think about that, I think our, our high watermark on royalties were in sort of the 14 to 16 billion dollar range so they're talking about us getting back to that level of royalties by 2023 so I, I think people will have to judge whether or not that is even likely and one more thing I would say as well is it's interesting to me that the other small parties seem to also have backed the UCP approach of reducing corporate income taxes I think we now have the NDP as the only party saying that they want to keep the corporate income tax higher which surprises me because it was it was quite a battle last time around it was a raise taxes on the rich and raise taxes on corporations 
position to get the money that you need for social programs. And now it seems like um, there's a bit of a split out there. Yeah, but I, and I guess the question is, do you believe, and, and by you, we're talking about party based on, you know, constitution. I mean, based on your, 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 the, the premise, the foundation of your entire perspective on what draws investment to a jurisdiction, on what creates jobs, what, what either spurs or reiterates investor confidence. Uh, where does that begin? What causes that? And, and, and does a cut in corporate income tax prove to be effective in drawing new investment to a jurisdiction? And, and, and I mean, I, I guess, you know, each political party based on their platform is going to argue that their approach is best on this one. Yep. Uh, you'll, and you I'm have sh- economists you're weighing in, too. I mean, I think Tuma said, yes, that the uh, the, uh, the corporate income tax cut will generate 55,000 jobs, as um, Jack Mintz has said as well. But he's not as, again, he's a bit of raining on the parade here on the NDP economic diversification plan says it'll attract 75 billion in investment to Alberta, produce 70,000 jobs in the next 10 years. But Toom says those don't appear to be backed by any published research. Yeah, so. D- Daniel, we've got uh, essentially the UCP uh, projecting if it wins the election, the budget for 2019-20 would show a 7.4 billion dollar deficit, followed by 6.6 billion uh, the year after that. The NDP deficit looks like 8 billion the first year, uh, shrinks to about 3 billion over the course of the next couple of years. Meantime. In BC, they spend less than us on health care. Their, their, their numbers appear to be just as good on health care delivery. And their budget shows forecasted surpluses of $274 million this year, $585 million two years from now. Keith Baldry, our colleague there, Legislative Bureau Chief with Global BC, our guest. Keith, thanks for joining us province-wide this morning. Oh, my pleasure. How is BC doing it? Well, taxes. Uh, BC likes to uh, tax people, whether it's the NDP or the Liberals. We have a carbon tax. We have a sales tax. We have a new employer health tax. Collectively, those uh, those three taxes uh, collect something like over $10 billion. We also have a property transfer tax because the real estate market continues to be a significant contributor to the economy. Um, so you put all that together, that gives a lot of revenue, provides a lot of revenue for the provincial government. So you mentioned the $274 million projected surplus. It's actually going to be probably a lot more than that because what uh, Carol James, the finance minister here, does is follows in the steps of her liberal predecessor, Mike DeYoung, who established the practice of uh, having a small surplus but uh, uh, sort of socking away more than a billion dollars in unallocated spending through what's called a forecast allowance, sort of a cushion in case revenues aren't realized, and a huge contingency fund. So uh, the B.C. books are in in pretty good shape. But again, if you take away that sales tax, you take away that... the carbon tax, uh, you take away the property transfer tax, the employer health tax, we would be in a very, very serious deficit position. Let me ask you, Keith, because I, I thought that one of the things that Alberta does differently is we've got a, a comprehensive, all-inclusive budget document that includes both operating and capital. I always felt like BC continued to have additional borrowing that they, de- that they did for capital that doesn't appear in uh, the, their surplus projections. Am I right on that? Keith? Hello. Yeah, did you hear that question from Danielle? No. Oh, geez. Okay. Uh, interesting. Uh, okay. Basically, Danielle, let me sum this up because it appears we have a communication breakdown here. Basically, she's saying a bit of a different structure in, in BC, Alberta with an integrated budget showing operating and capital expenses and BC continuing to roll with an alternative. Your insight on that? Yeah, well, our capital expenses are booked outside the operating side. So there's a very aggressive and expensive capital infrastructure program uh, in BC, as has been for years. Uh, so while the the government balances the books on the on the service delivery side and has done for for a number of years now, the debt continues to spiral upwards. The provincial debt uh, spirals upwards because of the very expensive over the next three years, twenty billion dollars is going to be spent on infrastructure, which is you know as we know roads, uh, bridges, uh, schools, hospitals, uh, rapid transit lines. Uh, it, right now. Um, Nobody's flagging that as a concern. The, the bond rating agency is saying that's fine because your debt ratio to GDP is still acceptable. At some point, though, uh, as infrastructure continues to deteriorate, stuff that was built 50 years ago it needs to be replaced or repaired. That Those infrastructure costs are not going away. So down the road, BC's debt situation could conceivably get to the point where it is flagged by bond rating agencies as a concern because it will start to exceed an acceptable debt-to-GDP ratio. In fact, a num- a two... Uh, uh, 
financial institutions a couple weeks ago downgraded their forecast for BC's econ- economic growth significantly, primarily because of the huge slowdown in the real estate market in British Columbia, notably Metro Vancouver. That had a disproportionate positive impact on economic growth the last several years. That's now starting to slow down and disappear. And that's going to slow down BC's economic growth. So the, the, the rosy years of BC in terms of economic growth may well be nearing an end, which means uh, balancing the books right now is possible on the service delivery end. A few years from now, who knows? Because if those revenues start to deteriorate or, or not increase, uh, BC's financial books could be in a bit of a perilous position. Keith, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate the insight from west of here. My pleasure. That's Keith Baldry, the Legislative Bureau Chief for Global BC. Uh, Daniel, sorry about that. Uh, To be nerdy for a second, so we're we're communicating via what we call a tie line, but we're taking Keith's call over the phone, and I guess that means he can't hear you, so. No problem. Um, And I think it's important because I know that other provinces like to brag about their surpluses, but if you say, yeah, if you don't count this $20 billion in capital funding that we need to borrow for, yeah, we're in surplus. At least we got back to honest budgeting in uh, in Alberta, and I do give the Rachel Notley government credit for that, that when we see a bottom line number saying it's going to be a $7 billion deficit, it's all in. It includes your operating shortfall as well as your capital shortfall, and I think that's the best way to do it, because when you get back into real surpluses, it means that you're also going to be able to cover your capital program out of that as well. well you want to take some phone calls? Yeah, indeed. Um, I've got Mel and Brian and Jim and Wayne on the line. Let Let's me go to do Mel that. first. Mel, go ahead. What's on your mind today? Hi, Danielle. Um, okay, I live in small town, Alberta. So uh, what, why is there such a disconnect between thought processes from basically rural Alberta, small towns, and the big cities? Because do the people in the big cities spend less, uh, you know, on taxes and all the fees and, you know, rate riders, stuff like that, that we do in small town Alberta? Um, I'm like a, a, a basically a low income senior. I know some of the programs the NDP would or they're proposing would benefit me, but I'm not willing to vote for a government that wants to increase spending so that my grandchildren or great grandchildren have to, you know have the burden of but, paying it back. Mel, thank you for that. I would say the difference, I don't know if you've got an insight on this, Brian. I think what it comes down to is that in rural Alberta, people are accustomed to doing stuff themselves. They've got to figure out their own problems. And so there's less reliance on government. The first answer, if you've got a problem, is, well, I'm going to talk to my neighbor. I'm going to talk to my family. I'm going to talk to my community. I don't think they necessarily think the government ought to do something about that. But when you live in a more urban environment, government is so present in your life that it may well be that that's the first place people look. Yeah, that's why people's heads explode when you start teeing up debates on things like the wheat pool. <laughs> <laughs> Want to get to a call here in uh, central northern Alberta, 780-496-0063. Julie, what prompted you to call? Well, you know what? I've been listening to all the rhetoric around um, the budget, and I thought that, you know what, it's really important that as Albertans, we stop looking at the past and the good old days and start looking at our future. I mean, we, we rode that boom we, benefit from, we benefited from it. Let's not pretend that Albertans are some sort of magically more able, um, you know, bit of, of Canadians that can manage our, our finances better than, than the other provinces. The reality is we had a lot of resources. We rode that boom. And that government's been relying on those resource revenues for any surplus that we have had over the past quarter century. So, yeah, we should probably see if we can balance the books. But um, I think we have to, you know, stop kidding ourselves. And I think any political party that says that they can balance the books on their own without working with others is kidding, kidding us and kidding themselves. This is a bigger problem than that. So, Julie, are you seeing are you seeing anything contained in any platform from any of the parties that you see as intuitive or, or on point? Well, so I, I, I do think that we've got a, a revenue problem, um, you know, where we do need to be bringing in more revenue. And, and it's an, environment, an environmental stewardship problem. I mean, I've got four, four girls. My oldest one's 10, and she's saying, Mom, like, the environment's so important to me. And so, you know, when we start looking about the future, that's going to be really important. And, and we have to accept that, um, you know, oil and gas, as we know it today, isn't what it's going to be in the future. So I think, 
I, I don't think any of the parties quite have it right. And what we need to do as Albertans is get past that rhetoric. We have to start looking at ourselves. So I'm going to disclose I've got an orange sign up. Um, and it's up to people like me and the guy with the blue sign across from me to go and, and reach a part, uh, like across those, um, those colors and say, hey, let's go for coffee. Let's cultivate some commonality here. Because at the end of the day, this is our collective province together. And there are some things that we can be doing. And if we can do that as citizens rather than... Um, you know, going and and just, um, you know, repeating the lines in our camps over and over again, then we're going to create a space that's more safe for our political leaders to rise to the occasion, too. Okay, Julie, I really appreciate that call. No, it's, it, and she makes a, such a good point, too. I mean, I, I know that we, we in Alberta love to pat ourselves on the back about how much wealth that we've had over the years, but the fact of the matter is it's all been reliant on oil and gas revenues, and it's not we're not going to get bailed out this time by oil and gas revenues, I, and notwithstanding the rosy projections that we see in the NDP budget. There's got to be some other solution. So I think she's trying to say, bring down the rhetoric and let's let's get real here about what it is we're going to do to yeah, get back into balance. One of the things that, that I think she touched on, which is important and... and uh, you know, I mean, if you take a look at the different, I mean, contained within the party platforms and, and their budgets, so to speak, these projected budgets, Danielle, there are projections on what they think that the W2I benchmark average price will look like, North American oil. Uh, the NDP has it for 2019-20 at 59 U.S. a barrel, rising to $70 a barrel by 2022-23. Uh, the United Conservatives, a, a little less bullish on that, 55 U.S. a barrel uh, for the next fiscal year, climbing to U.S. 62 over the same time period. So that's some insight into how they expect expect the markets to perform as well. Well, at least nobody's projecting $115 a barrel. I guess Wouldn't we've it got be that nice? as a saving grace. Do we, do we have time to take another call here? Yeah, let's do it. I got Brian on the line. Brian, go ahead. What's your thought today? Uh, happy birthday, Danielle. You. I Appreciate hope Bobby treats you good. Thank you. You, um, you and uh, Ryan had a uh, disagreement last week, and Ryan asked if you were for real uh, over uh, whether the uh, press covers the left and the right equally, and you are for real. And I can give you a couple of examples. Uh, the Sons of Odin show up at a UPC uh, rally, and uh, you and Rod both had uh, talk shows about the Sons of Odin. I'm not sure if Ryan did, because I don't listen to his show. But Premier Notley has an irregular meeting at the uh, Lethbridge Hospital, and you don't hear anything about it. Then again, you have... Uh, uh, you used to have, or maybe there still is, in the NDP caucus, a uh, communist uh, card call, uh, carrier. Is there a question and about the budget somewhere here? No. Okay. Okay, that's the theme of this conversation, and the entire province is tuned in. All right, Brian. Thank you for your comment. He's just wanting to to sure. Uh, he's got communists, and the uh, I got it. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the fact that there seems to be unequal coverage. I don't know that that is the case. I mean, I think you can get the fact that we he knows both of those stories means that they are being covered. So the information is getting out. Have you got another call on your end, Brian? Uh, you go ahead and take one. Okay. I also have uh, Jim on the line. Jim, go ahead. Your thought today. Okay. So not not totally on the budget, Ryan, but I'm I'm kind of there. See, the thing here with, 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 with Jason is Jason's got off point. And he had to raise the GSA, and he had to go down a whole bunch of roads that didn't need to be covered. As of today, according to Rachel Notley, the lying Rachel Notley, we were supposed to be $585 million to the good, according to her election campaign in 2015. And we're not there. She's claiming $70 billion in jobs and, and all of this stuff in 10 years. Well, how can you make that kind of comment? Like, she just spews stuff out like verbal diarrhea. Jim. You know, if, if, if Jason would stay on point and just go on the record of how this government has just disasterized health care with nothing over the last, they've done nothing over the last four years. If he would just stick to that as far as the budget goes, he would win land hands down. But he has to get off track. He's getting rattled because some people have been kicked out of his thing. He's showing weakness. He's not a Peter Law, he, and he's not a, uh, a Ralph Klein. And that's too bad, because I'm going to vote for him anyway. Jim. Just because Rachel is so bad. But that you, he's getting off point. Jason, get on point. Jim, Jim, thank you for that. Loud and clear, saying that he's getting distracted. But also pointing out, I think, can we trust this 
this NDP budget projection when they were supposed to be in surplus budget. Do we this trust time anybody's budget month. projections? I know. Well, the problem is that if you're going to rely on oil and gas revenues, then it, it's a it's a crapshoot. Um, it is. Because who knows? I mean, we've had it go down as what? As low as $20 per well, barrel. Well, this is, I mean, a lot of times, especially here in Alberta, Danielle, most specifically here in Alberta anyway, you, you take a, uh, when budgets are released every year, uh, people will be interested in a couple of things. What does increased spending look like? Where are cuts, if anywhere? Is it a deficit or, or, or not uh, projected? And where do they have oil pegged at? Like, that's that's one of the specific things that economists and armchair economists look at first, is where is the government at on where they think oil is going to go? Yeah, and that's why I think David Kahn injecting into the conversation, we need to start looking at reliable sources of revenue rather than have this roller coaster. I think that's a good conversation to have. I don't yeah. know if we're ready to make the kind of dramatic change that he's talking about yet. Yet, but maybe that's where we get to the to, to some kind of common agreement by everybody talking to each other. I think we got to take a break, Ryan. We better. So, so you can throw us out? <laughs> well, sure. You're listening <laughs> province-wide to Chorus Radio, Decision Alberta, with Daniel Smith and Ryan Jesperson. Welcome back. Danielle Smith and Ryan Jesperson going province-wide, taking your calls. We're talking about the budget today and whether or not you think that either party, both parties, neither party has a credible plan going forward. I've got one of our listeners here who says, surprising to me, staunch conservative, but lost my job in the oil industry, and I am strongly in favor of a, a provincial sales tax. We need the money. So people's views on this might actually be softening, Ryan. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, hey, I welcome the conversation on it. I mean, how do you implement it? How do you, how do you uh, work it out in a way that it's palatable to people? I just, you know, the, the whole idea of it, that it's a... a, a political suicide tax. Uh, I, I don't want to hear people, you know, cr- wailing and crying about this deficit and at the same time saying they're not even open to considering uh, new approaches to taxation. I mean, Daniel, there's a couple of things I think that are quickly worth mentioning. Tourists and visitors to Alberta pay into a sales tax that would help Alberta. It would stay here. And out-of-province workers, people that are here as contract workers or whatever, but maintaining a home address in another province, uh, there's a lot of tax that they're not paying in Alberta. Alberta that they could. They could keep a lot of the money here, and I think it's something worth exploring. Yeah, and I think David Kahn has also mentioned that because of harmonizing, the government has put forward a billion, the federal government has said that they have a billion dollars to give to a province for transition into a, a, an HST model. So that would be at least another one-time amount that would uh, would be pretty helpful. I've got another person, though, who looks at the other side, right? As opposed to looking at revenues, look at expenses. And he says, I firmly believe the budget can be balanced within two years. The UCP could easily cut the budget by 5% and free spending for three years and not lay off a single nurse or teacher. You have no idea the amount of waste within government. I don't know if he's from within government, but that's his view. Yeah, and I appreciate that listener texting both of our text lines to make sure that they get their text read, Danielle. Here's the thing. Uh, Parties always promise they can find the efficiencies till they get into government and then find where the biggest messes are, right? Let's find out what Rick has to say. Rick, you got a a comment to make on the budget? Uh, What is it? What party's platform is grabbing your attention most right now? Well, you know, I just get really, um, uh, you know, it's it's uh, such a negative, such a negative approach is excessive spending. So, at what point do we need to to find another way to tax society, another way to tax society, when governments maybe should be looking at reeling in, stop spending, find different ways to lower the cost to to operate their governments rather than and you know i listen to the people on the trail and when they're out there pounding knocking on doors everybody's out spending money at what at what point the re they the more they spend the more taxation you need all right rick i appreciate that comment and and danielle that's that's a fair one this is this is the bigger picture conversation yeah it is a fair one but it is also very tricky to go out and say yeah i'm going to cut because every public sector worker thinks is that my job that's going to go am i going to lose my teaching job or my nursing job or my my job as a social worker and that then that becomes a rallying point and it becomes pretty difficult to get elected on a platform like that yeah no kidding i mean i I got i need my calculator when i'm going to do stuff like this, Danielle, but I'm going to, uh, let me see, 22 billion, uh, you know, no, I can't even do it, forget it, 5% of it, right? It would be You're about talk- 110 million, 110 million bucks. Where are you going to cut that? 
like like out of health, for example. Especially like, since the majority of health care is uh, is salaries and benefits, right? Sure. Or where are you going to cut fifty five million out of education? Or where are you going to cut like five percent? And politicians, and to their credit, sometimes Jim Prentice did it with his caucus. You take a five percent pay cut, and that's great. It's symbolic, uh, but to apply that five percent across the board, well, uh, it would be devastating. Completely. And someone's corrected my mouth already. It's actually ten percent would have been two point two billion dollars off of a twenty two billion dollar budget. So actually, a five percent would be one point one billion. I'm using the difficult, right? I'm using the calculator on my phone that oh, I just realized now for the first time only gives me nine digits. That's not nearly enough. <laughs> Farmer Lars says I just can't trust the conservatives. This is on the text line. After many years of high money flowing through Alberta, we were left in debt, behind in upkeep, and yet many made amazing profits. That from Farmer Lar. And we got George on the line. He wants to talk about trust. George, go ahead. What's your thoughts today? Well, I think that it's uh High time that, uh, well, first off, I don't trust your pollster because he's fake news and you guys have become the same thing. But uh, the only way Rachel Molly can keep in her process is to bring in a sales tax. And the thing is, we have never, ever, ever had a revenue problem this problem. It's always been a spending. George, thank you for that. Sorry, George, you just got a little bit of noise in the background, but I think we got you. He's saying we've never had a a revenue problem. We've got a spending problem. Yeah, what do we have, 30 seconds? I'm going to give it to Spencer. Spencer, you got 30. Perfect. Um, I'm just taking a look at the um, at the UCP platform on their budget. They're quoting Jack Mintz. They're quoting Michael Kelly Gagnon. They're quoting a whole bunch of economists. Um, to the NDP platform, they don't have any references. Um, so I'll give the UCP credit. And, and full disclosure, I'm a UCP uh, supporter. Um, but at least the UCP is using references, not just... Uh, you know, I don't know where they get their numbers from. Okay, Spencer, I appreciate that. And that's a good data. point, Danielle. And that's something I suppose moving forward when we're interviewing leaders and talking about the budget, you do want to know. You remember Jim Prentice, again, when he rolled out his budget before calling the election that showed a deficit in, in the neighborhood of $6 billion. It was Jack Mintz's name that he invoked. Yeah, and having that external validation can matter to a lot of people in, term, in determining whether or not the budget has credibility. But we're now out of time. We'll do this again right. next week. I'm Let Danielle's me read this real quick. Oh, what? Can I? Yes. The the past president of the AUMA just sent us a tweet. So I think we'll go out on this from Lisa Holmes, former mayor of Morinville. Says, on the budget, I'm more interested in the infrastructure deficit in Alberta as opposed to the financial one. You can add in a revenue stream by way of tax or otherwise at any time, but rebuilding critical infrastructure takes years, and investment in that needs to happen now. We could probably have a whole segment on that, and maybe we will next week. Look forward to talking with you then. I'm Danielle Smith, and you are Ryan Jesperson, and we are done our province-wide broadcast. We'll talk to you again.